morning. morning. Do you see the sunshine this morning? Isn't it beautiful? It's going to be a beautiful week according to the weather forecasters. Of course, that's I guess up to Missouri. But right now, <laughs> would you stand with me? It is good to see all of you here this morning. It's kind of neat. The wings shut off and everybody moved to the center. It almost looks like there's more of you. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you. For this day, for these people that are here to worship. And Father, we pray you would bless our worship. We pray that you would bless each and every one that is here as an outpouring of your special love. And Father, we love you. And we thank you again for all of your wonderful blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Jesus, greater than all my sin, how shall my tongue describe it, where shall its praise begin, taking away my burden, setting my spirit free, oh the wonderful grace of Jesus, Reaches me. Wonderful, that's the grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for you and me, broader than the scope of my transgression. Greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Wonderful the grace of Jesus. Reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned. Safe to the uttermost, chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty for the wonderful grace of Jesus. Reach at me, wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper far than all the mighty sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for you and me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. His name, wonderful the grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the glorious grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain. All sufficient grace for you and me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Amen. You may be seated. Amazing grace. <laughs>
something to think about. We've been there 10,000 years. 10,000 years we can't imagine on this earth. And it won't be but a snap of your finger time in heaven and the joy that will be there. And it's thankful for the Rock of Ages that will help us get there, will get us there, I should say. Rock of Ages. Mm. Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in me. Let the water and the blood from my air inside which grown be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill my love's demand. Could my zeal no rest with no? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come before the dress, helpless strength to be for grace. Thou art to the fountain cry, watch me save your own while I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold me on my throne, rock of ages, clutch for me, 
As we prepare for communion this morning, there is a redeemer. assistance uh, in some way let us one of us know uh, didn't want anybody to have a tripping hazard this morning more than there already is so thank you for being here and dealing with the construction the painting so we all know about the Genesis story uh, I've joked about it before you know the fall of man was caused by a woman but then the man lied about it and caused the fall of man so we're all culpable in, in those regards, but I found a, a, a bit of scripture in reading about that and how uh, for a long time humanity didn't know to be shameful that they were naked in the case of Adam and Eve. So uh, God created uh, humanity as male and female. He took care of their needs and he showed them what a relationship was like. And he taught them how to love him and to love one another. And when they sinned and learned of their nakedness, God covered their shame as explained in Genesis 3.21. God made Adam and his wife tunics of skin and he clothed them. This is the first record of God ever clothing humanity. Up until that point, they just were shameless in their nakedness they, they weren't worried about it didn't didn't know enough to think about it probably initially adam and eve then knew nothing of evil shame or clothing when they disobeyed the fruit opened their eyes to evil and expo and the evil then exposed their shame god god clothed the people to cover the harvest 
of their rebellion against him. He also, also showed them the acceptable way to be clothed. God's action foreshadowed his plan to restore fallen humanity. God killed an innocent animal, <clears throat> and from it he fashioned a covering to hide man and woman's shame. And from that day until now, people have clothed themselves. It isn't the only time that God clothed people. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul explained a coming of divine clothing. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, nor but we will be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. On the day of the Lord, the second coming, these people who have followed after God in faith throughout their lives will be clothed again. Unlike the Genesis 3 account that I just read, uh, when people were clothed with perishable skins of animals, on that future day, we will be clothed in the incorruptibility of the Son of God. On that day, clothes will not hide the shame of our sin, but because Jesus died for us, like that innocent animal in Genesis 3, our shame will be gone forever. We eat this bread to remember the promise of our new clothing and that Jesus sacrificed was sacrificed despite his innocence. We also drink the cup, a reminder that Jesus' life blood was surrendered on our behalf. As you eat and drink, Give thanks to God for his grace, mercy, and the new clothing he has prepared for all who believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you that we can surround this table and remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. Bless us now as we partake. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of being in your house this morning. We thank you, Father, for this time to make our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ our sacrifice, but more importantly, his resurrection, so that you can offer us salvation. Now, Father, as we give back a portion of what you have given us, we pray, Father, that we'll give it with a cheerful heart, that it is used to glorify you in some way. Jesus' precious name we pray. Would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Of reading it from Mark 12, verses 41 through 44. The crowd were, were giving their gifts for God's great house. They, there was a box of money there. Her people threw their coins into it. Jesus sat there, the box, and his, near the box. And he watched them. Many rich people put a lot of money into the box. But then a woman came there. Her husband had died and she was very poor. She, she put two small coins into... She put two small coins that had only a little value into the box. Jesus asked his disciples to come to him. Let me tell you this, he said to them, this poor woman has put a better gift into the box than all the gifts people have put in there. All those rich people have plenty of money. They, they only put a small part of that hit into the box, but this woman has almost nothing. She put in all the money that she had that was all the money that she needed to live. Shall we pray? Dearest Father, thank you for this time that we could come to worship you. As we open our uh, open the, your scriptures, we pray, Father, that you will bless us with understanding and encouragement and strengthen, uh, strengthen us to serve you in a better way this next week. Be with Brother Tim as he brings this message. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning. What a mess. Of course, I'm referring to the world situation. Some of you might have thought I was referring to the uh, baseball owners and players negotiations. And uh, yet others of you might have thought I was referring to the room that we're uh, seated in. But what a mess. Uh, messes cause people uh, anxiety. Now, some people, other people kind of thrive on the chaos, kind of like the, the mess. Um, of course, oftentimes where you have a mess, uh, you're spending some money. And uh, that is true in the world situation and in the baseball negotiations and also in the room that we're sitting in. Uh, I did a little quick math, 104, this right across here, this archway down both sides and then the box, just the center box, not the wings, not what's behind me, 141 years old. 
So when you tie into something that's 141 years old, there's surprises. Um, you, you factor on that. You figure that there's going to be, and that happens. Um, there are challenges. They're doing a nice job. They're making good progress. Um, appreciate you today, your patience. You could, uh, I've always enjoyed in the past, of course, we've done communion different for months now. Um, in the past, I always enjoyed as I had my head bowed, you could hear the men walk down the aisle. Uh, you usually didn't have that paper crinkling noise um, that we had today, but it's a mess and uh, messes are expensive. And uh, anytime, if a mess doesn't cause you anxiety, money does um, for most of us. If you go to Mark chapter 12, where Cooper read for us uh, from there, as we're making progress through the gospel of Mark in between Christmas and Resurrection Sunday, about five weeks away, I think, we come to Mark chapter 12. And uh, as I was moving through that, um, it's a wonderful chapter. We've not been going exactly chapter by chapter. I just chose to do the ch uh, 12th chapter that way. But it's a wonderful chapter. I want to kind of start towards the middle, and then we'll work our way out a little bit and uh, forwards to backwards. But you start in Mark chapter 12 with this parable of the tenants. And it's this story about a man who planted Jesus is telling a story Mark chapter 12 is basically one scene. Um, Mark has a lot of action and a lot of movement. You'll say, and then, and quickly, and words like that as they switch from scene to scene. But in Mark chapter 12, it's one basic scene, and it sweeps through. And that's part of the reason I think we need to take the chapter uh, as a whole, because it is a whole, because it fits. Now, you know, and I know, that those chapter markings are not uh, divinely inspired. I don't want to give that impression. Somebody came along well after the Bible was written and decided where to put the chapters and where to put the verses. And sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. That's not divinely inspired. But just so that we have the opportunity to be a little more coordinated, somebody put the chapters and the verses. So I think they got it pretty right in chapter 12, because I think it groups really nicely. It is one setting, one context, one scene, and so it fits. He begins with the parable of the tenants, and he tells them that there is an owner who plants a vineyard, and then the owner goes on a trip. But while on his trip, it comes harvest time, and the owner, who is certainly entitled to his share of the harvest, sends people back to get his share, but the workers in the vineyard treat him shamefully. Verse 1, he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. Verse 2, at harvest time he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir, come, let's kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and they killed him and they threw him out in the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 12, they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. 
Now, where we were last week, we talked about the withered uh, tree and then into the question of Jesus' authority there in chapter 11. And we need to notice that this follows. This question of authority, Jesus tells the story of the tenants. I don't know how much they understood it. The picture is clearer to us. The prophets had come giving the message of God, telling them all that God had done for them and reminding them that they uh, owed allegiance to God, that God was worthy of their love because of all that he had done for them. And yet they mistreated, killed, shamefully uh, treated, and then God sends his son, his son whom he loves, and they kill him. In the foolish thought that if they killed the son of the owner, somehow that would entitle them to rights, that that wouldn't have consequences. And so he tells that on the tale of the authority question. I think one of the most important verses, one of the things that helped me group my thought in this section is when it says that they wanted to arrest him because they knew that he had spoken this parable against them. And then that phrase, that sentence, but they were afraid of the crowd. And I think that's important. If we read just a little bit farther, they're going to ask another question, same scene, another question about paying taxes to Caesar. Verse 13, later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Notice the motive. They came to him and said, teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. I think Mark did that on purpose in the, in, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd. And the, this mocking compliment that they give to Jesus, teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. We know that you are not swayed by the opinions of people, that you give no thought to the status of the person. There's an obvious juxtaposition there, obvious op opposite. They were afraid of the people. Jesus wasn't. Jesus knew who he was, where he had come from, and he stood on the truth. They were mocking him, but yet they were speaking prophetically. And then they asked the question, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? If you get your history books out, this is Jesus of Galilee, of course. If you read your history books, there was prior to Jesus of Galilee, a Judas of Galilee, who's not the Judas we normally think of, but he was killed over a question of taxation, claiming to be a great leader. And so they bring this question to Jesus, trying to trap him. And it says, but Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin, and he asked them, whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. All right, we're beginning to develop a little theme here. The authority of Jesus, the ownership of the vineyard, taxation question, and Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And I think we're beginning to develop this theme of authority and ownership. They're questioning Jesus' authority. He's giving them the hint that he is the son of the vineyard owner that came, that they have mistreated. They ask him the tax question. He's saying, yes, pay your taxes. But remember, and he, again, there's a lot here, Caesar worship, um, that they would have claimed to be God. That coin would have had an inscription. 
that Caesar himself was the son of God, there is this question. G uh, Jesus says, pay your taxes, but don't forget that what really belongs to God belongs to God. It's a two-sided answer. There is then this section, and I confess this section is a little more difficult, this section on marriage at the resurrection. Again, trying to trap Jesus, they post this hypothetical question. Moses said, back in the law, that if a man marries a woman and then the man dies without uh, producing any offspring, any heirs, then in the law, because of the, uh, the promised land and the dividing up of the property and all of that, that it was important that each person had an inheritance. That's uh, the law of uh, Jubilee and that every 49th year and property would go back so that people would keep the promised land so that it would be by the tribes and all of that. So the man passes away, his wife then would transfer in some way to his brother and his brother had a responsibility to produce offspring but in his brother's name. So the inheritance then would go back to the brother. Well, in this hypothetical, brother one passes away, wife transfers. Brother two passes away, wife transfers. Brother three, all the way through the seven brothers. Now, the Sadducees are the ones asking the question, and if you grew up in children's church, that you learned that the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. So the whole hypothetical is ridiculous because they don't even believe in the resurrection, but they're throwing Jesus this ridiculous question, well, who's she going to be married to in glory? She'd been married to all seven of them, and Jesus stings them with the answer. Verse 24, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? That'd be a pretty good lead-in in any argument. Uh, I was looking at a book. I did not buy it, but it was talking about the, uh, the dark side of communication, the ability to manipulate others. It's kind of a sales leadership book, and it had these tactics that you use, um, these devices that you use, to win arguments, to put the person that you're uh, discussing with in a deficit position, in a weakened position, so that you can manipulate them and get them to do what you want. It, again, the dark side of communication. That's pretty good. This is not the dark side of communication. This is Jesus. But when you open with a line, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures? or the power of God, and you're talking to religious professionals, that's pretty strong. That, that immediately sets the tone. And of course, we've got a tone going on in this conversation. Jesus says, verse 25, When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Verse 27, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Again, an authority issue, an ownership issue, a position of God issue. That one is not as obvious, I confess, but I still believe that our theme's intact. They're questioning the authority of Jesus. They're questioning the ownership of God of all things. They are challenging. We come to verse 28, probably one of our favorite scriptures for many of us. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burning, uh, burnings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that the man answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask him more questions. While Jesus was teaching, so we're continuing, same scene. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, how is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls himself, excuse me, David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplace and have the most influential seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for such a show and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. I think we need all that context to understand now that he's going to lead into that part that Cooper read for us about the widow and her offering. This question of authority, this question of ownership, this question of entitlement, as he deals with these people who are seeing themselves as authorities, who are seeing themselves as the owners. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but the poor widow came and put in two very small coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Remember last week when we talked about, or uh, that was last week, we talked about Jesus going into the court of the Gentiles and tossing the tables and clearing the temple. And we made mention of the fact that the court of the Gentiles was God's way at the temple, his intention that they had, and out, the outsiders had a place, that outsiders could come to the temple, not yet into the Holy of Holies, not yet into the inner regions of where uh, his people could go, but he made a place for outsiders. The temple was God's gift. It was the place of his presence. It was his gift to his people but it was also his gift to the world, showing that outsiders could come and participate. One of the things that we should not miss here, and I'm not going to, it's not, maybe not the thing, but I don't want to miss it. You like to people watch, right? Everybody likes to people watch. I guess they don't, we don't hardly have malls anymore, but that's where we used to think of it. We would sit at malls and just people watch, at least guys would. Um, while women were shopping, they would have places uh, where you would just sit and people watch. And you do that in different places. Jesus has come through and Mark is recording this. Holy Spirit is inspiring this. 
and after all of this teaching, Jesus sits down, and he's watching these people come large bags of coins into the temporal treasury. And here comes this woman. The coins that she is bringing, she can't tithe off of those coins because they're the smallest coins. Like she would have had to physically have broke it in half. There was no portion smaller than the portion she had to give. And Jesus watches this. She's a widow. The law makes very, the Old Testament law makes very clear this scene should never have happened, right? There shouldn't be people with bags of money while this widow woman is penniless. The temple was God's gift, not only to the world, to the inside, not only to his people, the insiders, but also to the outsiders, those who were marginalized. This should have never happened. Now, the point is that what she does, Jesus commends, and that's right. But you have to notice it, that this scene should have never happened. If the temple that God left, if his presence on earth was functioning as it should have, this would never have happened. The fact that she was in the situation she's in demonstrates the brokenness of God's people. The injustice of those who were using religion to get rich, the injustice of those who would go into the courts of the Gentiles and turn it into a marketplace uh, to charge ex exorbitant rates and take advantage of people who were trying to get closer to God. Now, of course, the fact is that we now are the temple. We now are the residents of the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us, that our bodies are a temple. And you have to make the connection here, not just that, well, that sweet old lady was really nice. My dad would correct me. He did, he did it elderly. You don't, I heard that. I heard it. I appreciate that. Uh, that elderly lady, I shouldn't have called her an old woman, that poor elderly lady, that should have never happened. And in the same way, that's us. As the temple of God, we should be aware of the needs around us. You go to the book of Acts and you jump ahead and it talks about how they shared together that there was no needy person among them. They, Barnabas goes out and sells a field and brings the profits in, uh, the proceeds in to the apostles so that it can be shared. And there is in us a natural, capitalistic, well, yeah, but I worked, I earned, uh, I deserved. And that's not wrong. Uh, as long as we remember that God gave us that ability to work, God gave us that opportunity, there has never been a richer generation of Christians than the one that we live in. And again, we're quick to say, well, yeah, but not us. There's actually people who are richer than us. You're talking about people who live in suburbs. You're, people, you're talking about people who live in big cities. You know, we're, we're not, and again, that's so narrow. We're in the upper one percent. Uh, this ability to share, this question of authority, this question of ownership. As we look around us, as we consider these things, as we look at and do cost benefit analysis and think, well, and we take in a way, and I, my language is not good here, I don't have clarity in this to say this the way I want. Stewardship is a good thing. But when we put stewardship ahead of discipleship, and again, we have to have this, you and I have to communicate here on definitions. These people that were coming and throwing in large bags, I'm saying they were practicing stewardship. They were giving. 
they were able to say that I'm going to take a part of what I have and I'm going to give it to God with the implication that I'm going to help God with God's problem. I'm willing to chip in and help God. And, and that's not real stewardship, but I'm thinking about it in those terms with this scripture. And then you look at this and you say, well, it's not just enough to give some of what you have. That doesn't accomplish the mission of the temple in the Old Testament. That doesn't accomplish the mission of the church in the New Testament. If we just chip in and say, well, I want to do my part to help pay the bills. I want to do my part uh, so that things can continue. And, and you say, well, I, you need to move closer to it. That's what Jesus is showing with her, this complete trust this complete awareness that even if you only have a tiny amount, all of it belongs to God. And this idea to move from uh, stewardship to discipleship. Discipleship has to do with following. And I, and I want to see that progression. Again, I don't like all of my words uh, in my descriptions, but discipleship being this idea of following Jesus more than just chipping in to help Jesus or God with his problems or just contribute to the ministries of the temple or the church. But there's more involvement in following. It's more connected. And yet following, which is absolutely right, discipleship is absolutely good. But in this picture of just I'm kind of following Jesus, I am desperately interested in what he's doing. I'm curious if he could help me with my problems. Not just I'm willing to chip in to help the church help other people, or, but now I'm, I'm curious to see if God could help me. Moving a, a step farther into it, and he talks not only about following, but this idea of belonging, that we would look at this and, and we would say, you know what? I belong to God and he and I are together in this. And so he and I work on my problems and this increasing gradient, this increasing closeness until you finally make the full transition to where this lady is, that she acknowledges that it, God's going to have to take care of me. And the anxiety that comes from the mess that we're in, the anxiety that comes from money oftentimes, to make this transition that the owner of the vineyard, this, this authority question, this ownership question, that it all belongs to him. If, if I have to help solve the problem, that causes me stress. That causes anxiety. When we come to rest in the fact that God is the owner of the vineyard, that God is the giver of the temple, that God is the provider, the more we can disconnect behavior from the love of God. Now that's salvation, but that's also in Christian living. But the more we can separate behavior I need to do this, I need to be more, I need to try harder, I need and recognize that God cannot love us any more than he loves us right now. There's a, an axiom, there's a, a principle in play that the harder I try to be better, it doesn't work. The more stressed and anxious the more that I am willing to recognize that God's love is not dependent on my behavior, the better my behavior will get. That it actually works in opposite. This, what he says about love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. This loving as the first priority. That if we get that right, 
this whole issue. Okay, and I don't, I know I'm, the clock's not up, so who knows. Um, the Greeks, Romans, had the idea that if you could just subdue your emotions and, and be disciplined, that was real success. Our generation, our world that we live in, our generation, our world that we live in has flipped that. The real meaning of life is dealing with your emotions, right? Self-realization, letting your desires and all that. You don't worry about discipline. You, you're trying to, to express your emotions. Jesus comes through and says, no, it's your heart. Separate even from your mind. That sounds wrong. But your emotions, it's what you love. It's the affection. It's what you treasure. It's what you put your hope in. It's where you place your value. If you set your affection right, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then these money, money is not the problem and money is not the answer. And when we learn that, when we learn that I am not the solution to my problem and in many ways that I am my problem that we find this affection when we realize what Jesus has done for us apart from us then we can start to love him and this issue of affection I find this 12th chapter fascinating because of all the things that he ties together. And as you are, are experiencing, I don't have complete clarity on this. But this issue of what this woman is capable of doing because of where her trust and affection is placed and how vastly different that is from those who have their trust in themselves in their behavior, in their position, in their appearance, in their authority. This willingness, humility to submit, to acknowledge that Jesus is the owner and to move from simply chipping in to recognizing that he is the owner. I was driving yesterday morning and I had this singular thought, I, I don't, this question of ownership. Does your heart belong to Jesus? And I think we're quick to say, well, yeah, I like, I trust in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I, does your heart belong to Jesus? Because that's the issue. Behavior, morality, ethics, in many ways, these people appeared to have it, these false teachers but they were devouring widows. This circumstance should have never happened that this woman was like that. God has always been after our heart. You can chase it uh, up to where we are in Mark. Jesus knew their hearts. Um, all of these different passages, their stubborn hearts, their hearts are far from me. Out of the heart comes evil thoughts. It is a question of the heart. It is a question of our affections. The things that cause us stress will melt away if we could concentrate on the affection of loving Jesus. Let's stand. Our Father, we thank you for this good day. We thank you for your great love for us. And Father, we pray that you would teach us that you would show us, as you have through Jesus, that what we might experience what it truly means to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That our sense of following, our sense of belonging would evolve into this sense of, of worship and loving. Lord, that we would trust you that we would rest in you. Lord, help us through the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Let's sing.